Thank you, Lerato. Good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen, and, and welcome to our webinar. Uh, this is part of the um, SA Future Economy um, Dialogues. Um, as those of you who've participated before um, would know, SA Future Economy is a project um, that we have initiated at the Witt School of Governance uh, with the generous support um, of Telcom, where we are looking at South Africa's economy, especially now in light of the COVID pandemic and, and the impact that it's having on the economy. But of course, cognizant of the fact that um, a lot of the challenges we face uh, predate COVID and perhaps um, COVID has made it ever more pressing and urgent to think more creatively about the future and what needs to, to, be, to be done in order to get our economy back on track uh, and to reverse some of the, the negative effects that we've been seeing over the past couple of years. One of the um, areas, of course, that is critical in any discussion about South Africa's economy is the issue of energy. And that's why we're so pleased today that we have um, Professor, um, Dr. Iraj Jibedian, who will be speaking to us on um, the energy transition. And in particular, we had an, there's an interesting discussion that has to be had on the just energy transition. Uh, and I think he wants to unpack that a bit and give us more of his thoughts and generate, you know, stimulate some, some debate on that. Um, but I'll leave that to, to Iraj um, and just to thank him for the paper that he's produced. Um, in a way, this is a validation workshop. Um, and, you know, after the inputs from this, uh, we finalize the paper and um, it will be available on the Witt School of Governance website for the project. Um, without taking up more time, let me say thanks once again, not only to Iraj, but also to our um, facilitator, um, as well as to our discussants um, who've kindly agreed to participate today. And just to thank the marketing team who have been so good at putting together um, these webinars. Um, so thank you so much to all of you. Um, at the end um, of the year, it's very difficult to hold our concentration. Um, so we look forward to this discussion and this will be the last of the dialogues. Um, and please look out at the beginning of the year for further information um, from, the, from the events team um, as we're thinking of, of hosting a, a dialogue that will be more in-person, face-to-face. I think we're all yearning for those kinds of discussions after a year of, of webinars. But as I say, more information will be sent out and emailed um, and publicized through the school's website and Twitter account and email. All right, so uh, without uh, further ado, uh, Prof Loazi, I hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nobundo. Um, once again, welcome to everyone, uh, everyone joining us on Zoom and also via Facebook. Um, and just to give you a quick run through of how we're going to do today, I'm going to give a but 15 minutes or so uh, to Dr. Abidjan uh, to talk us through the paper and his thoughts. Um, and then we will then have a discussion. Uh, but what, how we're gonna run the discussion is I will go through um, to each one of the participants. Uh, I will introduce each one, every single one of them um, and um, we'll then take questions uh, and have a Q and A session. You can post your questions on Facebook, um, but you can also post them on uh, on Zoom, and we will try and attend to all of your questions. Um, so, without wasting any more time, I think our speaker today really needs no introduction. Um, Dr. Abidjan, uh, most of you will know him very well. Uh, he's the founder and executive chairman of Pan Africa Capital Holdings. Uh, he's also chief executive at Pan African Investment and Research Services. Uh, before this, uh, he, he was uh, in the education sector actually, um, until he entered the business sector in about 2000. Uh, he was a professor of economics at, at UCT. Um, his credentials uh, go along as such, he's got a BA honors, MA in economics uh, from UCT. Uh, he's got a PhD in economics from Simon Fraser University in Canada. Um, he's well known um, across the policy uh, space. He served as a consultant uh, on economic policy issues, both private and public sector. Uh, he's been involved in the policy development in South Africa from 
involvement in the development Bank of Southern Africa, uh, the RTP white paper in 95, um, employment and redistribution gear, um, midterm expenditure framework, 97, 98, the, the list goes on. Um, you know, he's, he's a well-known researcher, uh, written a number of articles, uh, co-authored books, uh, such as economic growth in South Africa. I will not read his entire CV. I uh, would be here for a good 20 minutes, just going through his CV if, if I try and do that. Um, but currently, uh, apart from being um, involved in the Pan-African Capitals portfolio, he also serves as a, board, a chairman of the board at MSOL, a uh, member of the advisor board of the AGSA, and also a member of the uh, advisor board of council for Adma advancement of South African constitution. Um, Dr. Abidian is, is a powerhouse uh, in the space, and like I said, he really needs no introduction. Um, so for now, I will hand over to him. Um, I, want us, I want him to take us uh, through his thoughts uh, on firstly what the just transition means to him um, and, 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 and what he sees um, as, as a policy uh, route going forward and on how we can ensure uh, a just transition and, and, and how all of this will impact our communities. Dr. Abidian, over to you. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, I greatly appreciate the opportunity and um, greetings to everybody and to all our panelists uh, and for all the kind introductory words. Um, I've got, uh, uh, as I understand, about uh, 15 minutes um, to share with you the paper. Um, I had put together a, 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 a presentation, PowerPoint presentation, uh, but I'm not going to go through it. I'm going to share with you um, just the outline and speak to, uh, to the key issues. I uh, just want to make sure that we can all see it. Um, this is the outline of the paper. Um, let me begin with, and, and I really want to pick on four key issues, this whole question of, of just transition, then look at uh, macroeconomic and, and, and industrialization potential that we have, uh, very key issues of municipalities and, and how what happens to them and, and what are the options for, for municipalities. Uh, and then very importantly and close to my heart is the issues of regions the subcontinent particularly. So let's begin with the first issue, just transition, uh, terminology that means different things to different people. Uh, and yet, uh, in my humble view, from a macroeconomic point of view, um, it's a really a fairly useless trans uh, concept in terms of uh, just because it brings so many uh, inexplicable and partisan concepts, for example, just for uh, the workers who are employed in the coal industry means um, take care of them and their families and their welfare. Let's say there are 40,000 of them. Then uh, just for those who, who over the past 12 years have lost their jobs and the companies that are closed, opportunities that have been lost uh, is a completely different thing. It's, it's very unjust to those who lost their jobs for protecting a coal industry just for communities that are suffering from the consequences of coal mining uh, and, and the abuse of water resources is one thing for those who are in the industry, something else. So I submit that from an economic and policy point of view, the concept of just should be replaced by uh, the notion of optimal uh, configuration of transition from one uh, system to another, because optimality has a different connotation a, a, a lot more manageable and a lot more realistic, and it helps policymaking. Um, and I I'm, I'm fully sympathetic to, to the concern that, that some people have, um, because it requires, uh, when we talk about uh, trans, uh, exiting one situation and, and, and configuring the other, it requires a proper policy configuration, proper on-time, on-budget implementation, and for me, that's the, the discourse that I would submit we should promote and we should focus on. Um, at the moment, over the past 12 years, as we all know, 
in pursuit of this partisan concept, uh, spoken and unspoken of just transition, South, South Africa has been downgraded three times, uh, lost uh, billions of investment opportunities, and uh, energy has been at the heart of this economic contraction. I am mindful that it also has been the victim of a state capture and all kinds of other political shenanigans. But nonetheless, energy has been the key and pivotal point of this economic contraction and loss of jobs and the industrialization that we have experienced. So when we talk about uh, the crisis that we are, we can, I don't intend going back and writing historic book where we are, we, we find ourselves in the hole that we are. But in that, I also submit that we have a, a, a very real and, and, and promising opportunity to turn the, 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 the crisis of energy and the damage that it has caused into a different paradigm of a more diversified, more sustainable, and more environmentally compatible, and I would argue socio-economically uh, compatible uh, reinvigoration of this sector using new technology. I'm not in favor of closing down coal. I do not believe it's practical, nor is it economically uh, optimal from economic point of view. Therefore, the question for me is how do you optimally trans exit what we have and configure a new industrial uh, uh, energy focused uh, hub in the, in the country and in the subcontinent. So what are the macroeconomic issues that we need to be very worried about? Up to now, has, as much as we may not have liked coal and the, the consequences on the environment and air and, air and water and so on, the reality is that South Africa has over the past hundred odd years has been uh, has been uh, with respect to energy pretty much um, self-sufficient. Um, uh, we've had some relatively low intensity with respect to our electricity generation um, because everything was domestic. Uh, there was some imported machinery and so on, but nonetheless, by global standards, our energy sector had very low import intensity. However, if we do not manage and, and configure our policies optimally going forward, the push for uh, wind, solar, and other alternative technologies could turn our economy uh, uh, into an import dependent energy sector, which, which I would not recommend and I would see it as, as highly problematic. However, if we configure the policies and sequence them suitably, so that we manufacture the items that are required, we could create jobs, we, we, cre we could create a, a reindustrialization of this sector and minimize, not eliminate, minimize import intensity in the renewable energy. If we then put that in the context of, of the, the subcontinent, um, I, I see a lot more opportunities. We've done some very high level econometric work suggesting that much like the telecommunication industry, cell phone industry, if you prefer, in the late 90s, where telecom say was the only source of telecommunication by and large, when we embraced eventually the new technology, we managed to create uh, at the moment uh, something in the order of 260,000 jobs across the country. Uh, and that's because the technology was decentralized unlike telecom industry, much like that and far more powerfully when it comes to energy and, and renewable energy or alternative uh, portfolio of energy generation, electricity generation, uh, instead of all being in Mpumalanga and Midrand, these jobs could be uh, in terms of manufacturing of, of accessories and equipment, as well as repair installation and so on and so forth. Uh, in terms of our work suggests that something in order of 250 to 350,000 new jobs could be created provided we sequence the manufacturing of the accessories and the panels and other required machinery uh, and as at the same time collaborate with the banking sector in order to make sure the asset financing of it is not confined to, um, to, a, to a select community uh, but is right across 
the households and commercial enterprises and agribusinesses and so on and so forth. Through that, we minimize import intensity, we maximize job creation and growth. Then if I move to the impact that it would have on municipalities and local government finance, we all know that municipalities have had historically a very easy uh, petty cash that they've been drawing on, uh, get from ESCOM, uh, sell it, add huge margin uh, on it, and basically make easy money. Um, and some of them make the money and never pay to es uh, ESCOM at all, uh, to the tune of roughly 20 billion rand up to now. So we have all kinds of modalities in between the municipal finance space that municipalities essentially have become addicted to easy sources of revenue um, and that has to change technology has changed that however much we want to resist that and however we politicize that the reality is that technology has made it possible um, to move away and has made it impossible to stay with the old way so when the municipalities and, and 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 the policy around municipal finance has to assume that by and large the old model has gone by that, I mean central generation of electricity shifted or, or transmitted or carried from Mpumalanga to Cape Town and then on sell it to the, um, so to the, to the victims who have no other option. Uh, and, and you can slap on it as much as you like. That model is no longer acceptable, either uh, socially or economically. So municipalities have to reinvent themselves, accept that reality and explore opportunities for localized by that mean in their jurisdiction localized energy generation and transmission to the residents and to the economic entities and come to a sensible sustainable and viable uh, commercial arrangements uh, at the same time even within that model they not to segment the market commercial and, and manufacturing would be very different from households and other enterprises and micro enterprises so the, the, the system, in my view, has become a lot more complex. Municip municipalities must trim down. They, they need to reinvent themselves and go for efficiency. If I may just touch on the last point on the regional side, I believe that the economic prosperity of South Africa and the region, the subcontinent of Africa, are, are pretty inseparable. They are interlinked. And therefore, we need to think of, of uh, a, a regional approach to sustainable and economically viable and globally competitive energy generation and energy pricing, which would affect the cost of doing business and return on investment and promotion of social welfare in the subcontinent. And in that regard, the blend of sources of electricity is not just wind and, 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 um, and gas in addition to coal, but also uh, in my view, is great opportunity with respect to hydro um, and respect to other sources. And when put in the context of the subcontinent, we have a great deal of a scale and therefore competitive pricing and investments become a lot more viable. And in that regard, I believe long term planning for sustainable energy in South Africa should be contextualized within the subcontinent in order to create the scale for different types of energy generation address or focus on different uh, segment of the market. To just uh, illustrate as my closing note, by segmentation, I mean our deep level mining or precision manufacturing uh, including pharmaceutical, petrochemical, and any kind of food processing that requires precision manufacturing also requires a different type of energy baseline and reliability. So what may be suitable for my home and for my um, shop and for my uh, uh, commercial enterprise may not be suitable. In fact, is not suitable, would not be suitable for the promotion of industrial and precision manufacturing. Therefore, at the subcontinent level, we need to segment these different markets and provide accordingly. Uh, I'll stop uh, share here and then we can have a follow up discussions. Thank you so much, Raj. Um, I think what we'll do, I'll wait for, uh, for us to finish uh, the entire 
program, and then we'll we'll get to the questions. Um, there are, of course, uh, a few things that I'm pretty sure in the minds of the audience are already popping up. Um, for example, you know the current unbundling of ESCOM. Um, how you perhaps see that having a, an impact on on what your definition of, of what the trust transition is. Um, uh, perhaps that's something for you to to think about um, and see if we can address that. Um, coming up next, uh, we've got uh, Mr. Chris Yellen. Um, he's also another one that really needs no introduction at all. Um, he's an electrical engineer uh, from, he got his degree from University of Natal, very long time ago, uh, 1976. Um, <laughs> um, he's the founder and, and MD of EE Business Intelligence. Um, and EE business, e business Intelligence provides uh, strategic analysis, consulting, writing, and communication services uh, on policy, economic, social, regulatory standardization, training, and business development. Uh, and this is all around issues of energy, electricity, and ICT sectors uh, across the continent. Um, many of you will know that uh, as of this year, Chris was appointed um, as, as an energy advisor to Outer, that's the organization on doing tax abuse. Um, but he was also appointed as an associate consultant uh, for IntelliDex uh, with a leading financial services and capital markets research group. Um, in 2018, Chris was awarded uh, the prestigious South African Institute of Electrical Engineers President's Award. Uh, and this was in recognition for his outstanding contribution uh, to the South African electrical engineering industry. Uh, he's a registered uh, chartered member, actually, um, uh, with the uh, Institute for Electrical Engineers, uh, that's in the US, and the South, South African Institute of Elect Electrical Engineering. Uh, he's also a member of the Engineering Council in the UK. Uh, Chris, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lawazi, for the intro, and thank you very much to uh, Iraj for, for his um, uh, paper, which I've read through, and uh, for his uh, introduction and comments uh, to the paper, uh, which we, we've just heard. Uh, I must say, I agree with uh, virtually everything that uh, Iraj has said in his paper. Uh, I do take, uh, you know, I have differences uh, of, of nuance in certain areas, uh, and, and I want to discuss a few of them as, 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 as we speak today, and I've got about eight minutes to do so. Um, so, uh, yeah, I agree entirely that the question of just means different things to different people, uh, and therein lies a lot of problems. Uh, ultimately, uh, what I think one would try to avoid uh, by uh, having a carefully coordinated transition is to avoid these uh, social wounds uh, and economic wounds in the side of South Africa. Uh, that present both social and political and economic problems for decades to come uh, if we don't address them uh, properly uh, in a way that uh, deals with these problems and helps us move on and not leave these festering wounds behind us. Um, so uh, that's the kind of way I see the just transition. The transition itself is inevitable and is happening as we speak, both in South Africa and globally. Uh, and the question is how uh, to uh, uh, to make this transition in a way that doesn't leave these wounds in our side that come back to haunt us. Uh, so uh, uh, Iraj has talked about the need for uh, planning and coordination and deregulation and liberalization, and I agree entirely with, with those ideas. Uh, somewhere I want to just uh, differ slightly, uh, just a small point of emphasis talks about the different types of energy, uh, you know, the, the, the stuff that is used for households and uh, shops and things that it doesn't have to be that reliable, and the stuff that is used for precision engineering and manufacture, which needs to be reliable, dispatchable, and cost effective. And he points to these being two different uh, types of energy. I, I would differ for, for, from that. The, the point is that uh, the combination or the blend of wind and solar and gas and energy storage does provide reliable, dispatchable power. Uh, that is also the least cost option for new power going forward and is the most cost effective. 
So it's this concept of baseloadism, I think is a concept of the past. As we move to the future, uh, there's the question of a variable renewable energy complemented by flexible power in the form of uh, gas to power and uh, energy storage, which could be pump storage, can be uh, battery storage, uh, can be uh, different techniques uh, of storage. So, uh, but in the end, these are all the same thing. And these do provide reliable, dispatchable, cost-effective solutions for both domestic, commercial, agricultural, industrial, manufacturing applications. So that's just a point of difference. Uh, we do need to, I believe, look at short, uh, medium and longer term solutions uh, to meet the immediate needs that we have and the, uh, the, the longer term needs. Uh, and in this process of industrialization, which is so important and critical has been alluded to uh, by Iraj, I believe is the question of spatial planning. And we need to take this into account very carefully in the just transition. Uh, and uh, the, the first thing to note, uh, is it's been highlighted in a report by GIS to, S, uh, to GIZ to ESCOM and to Department of Mineral Resources and Energy that in fact, uh, from a, uh, we do not need to build all our solar power in the Northern Cape. We do not need to build all our wind power on the East and West coasts of South Africa. We have good resources across the country and what one loses in, in perhaps it's a slightly suboptimal um, uh, wind and solar resource, uh, one makes up for avoiding losses uh, in transmission losses. Uh, and really one should try and locate these things as close to the customers as possible. Uh, and it doesn't make uh, any difference really uh, to the, 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 the cost of, of, of the electricity, whether you have it in the Northern Cape with solar uh, or you have it in Gauteng. The, the sun also shines in the Free State, in Gauteng, in Limpopo, in KZN. So uh, we should be looking at reindustrializing re where there are old declining towns, where there is existing infrastructure, existing roads and houses and schools and clinics and skills and services. Uh, these exist uh, and uh, this would be the optimal place to, uh, for a reindustrialization. Re uh, and here I'm talking about, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the coal fields of Mpumalanga, uh, the platinum fields of the Northwest and the gold fields of, of the Free State. Uh, these are obvious places for reindustrialization around the green economy. Uh, and, uh, you know, I often hear the words, you know, we have this natural heritage of abundant coal. We mustn't waste it. We must use it. This is the, but you know, this is really only a heritage uh, to the miners themselves. As long as the coal mining industry don't have to bear the costs of the carbon levy, the carbon tax, that's all borne by customers uh, of roads, repairing of roads, that's borne by municipalities and provincial government, and that means the taxpayer, health, damage to health, damage to the environment, ground and water and air pollution, decommissioning of old power stations and reclamation of coal mines uh, and restoration, uh, uh, these all don't get born by the coal mining industry. Uh, they get born by the people of South Africa. So a natural heritage is different things to different people. You know, we have plenty of asbestos in South Africa, but we decide to leave it where it belongs, in the ground, because there are better, cleaner, healthier, and more cost-effective solutions. Uh, we need to focus on South Africa's competitive advantages Wind and solar are a huge competitive advantage for South Africa globally. Uh, and we have also access to value adding green minerals with upstream mining potential and downstream beneficiation and manufacturing potential in the form of platinum, vanadium, cobalt, nickel, zinc, and more. Uh, these are the so-called green minerals that we need to be looking at, uh, that entrepreneurs need to not be hooked on coal. In fact, it's a declining market. They, uh, the real entrepreneur should be looking at, at, at green mining. Uh, I'm just about out of time, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, so I, I just want to say that we need to focus on job creation, not just in the energy sector, but across the economy. Uh, and we can, in fact, ensure reliable, abundant, and affordable electricity. Um, uh, the transition is going to take decades. There is time, though. There will be natural attrition in the coal and old power generation sectors with the retirement of an aging workforce so that we can focus on training of upcoming new workforce. 
We need policy, certainty, encouragement, and incentivization, not top-down central command and control and micromanagement. We need to create the right legal policy, uh, uh, regulatory, and planning framework. We need to put out clear and consistent legal policy, planning, tax, and economic signals and messaging for response by the market and the private sector. For example, investment incentives. We need to lift foreign exchange restrictions. We need to provide tax incentives, spatial lo location incentives. We need to put in import tariffs to encourage localization. We need to lift immigration blockades. We need to facilitate work permits. We should not be prescribing uh, you know, what we should manufacture locally and what should be localized. Uh, and, and, and we should not be prescribing uh, demands for skills transfer. We need to encourage investment and technology agreements, skills transfer, building and manufacturing capacity where we have a competitive edge. Uh, we need to create the right social, economic, business environment with access to water, housing, education, healthcare, and security. And we need to build trust between government, the private sector, and the public sector. And in these ways, I do believe that we can have a just, just transition. And by that, I mean avoid these wounds in the side of South Africa for the next uh, 20 years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, those are indeed uh, very wise words. Um, there is a few things that I think um, you know will come up in, in, in the questions that will be directed at you. So please stay with us and uh, and and see how we can attack those. But um, one of the things I'd, I'd like you to think about um, is really just how you know the both the direct and indirect. Uh, subsidies that that we um, you know sent towards the coal industry um, how that is prolonging I suppose uh, the, the process of decarbonization um, I'd really like to get your comment on that uh, up next uh, we've got uh, Dr. Grovestein um, he's another one who really needs no introduction um, for anybody that's been in the energy sector um, Dr. Stein is the MD of uh, Meridian Economics and that's an energy and infrastructure economics advisor firm uh, and is based out in Cape Town. Uh, he's been in the industry for more than 25 years uh, in electricity, gas and liquid uh, fuels sectors. Um, he sits on the Presidential Economic Advisor Council, uh, but was also uh, appointed uh, in 2018 uh, to the ESCOM Sustainability Task. Uh, task team. Uh, so this is someone who you know who knows the energy industry uh, in and out. Um, you know he was the primary author of our electricity chapter of the ninety eight energy policy white paper. Um, he's been involved in in efforts to restructure ESCOM uh, as far back as as two thousand. Um, he's also served on the liquid fuels windfall tax task team. Um, who was he was then appointed by by the then finance minister uh, Trevor Manuel. Uh, Dr. Stein has got a, a B engineering degree, uh, industrial engineering from Stellenbosch. Uh, he's got a BA uh, in economics and, and sociology from UNISA and an MSc Eng uh, in energy studies from UCT. Uh, but he also holds a, a PhD or a DPhil rather uh, from Success University. Uh, and, and his DPhil was looking at the reforms in the UK and South African power sectors. Um, so. Thank you very much, Dr. Stein, for joining us, uh, and I will hand over to you. Rosie, thank you. Thanks for those kind words, and uh, thank you for the host for inviting me to, to this important conversation. Um, and yes, um, like uh, Chris, I also wanted to uh, thank uh, you, Raj and his colleague for um, for this paper, which I think is an important con contribution to the discussion and debate that we're having in this space, so the absolutely critical uh, dis discussions that we're having now around the energy sector and the energy tran transition. So um, yes, I mean, I and I'm in broad ag agreement with with most of the points uh, made, and I, really my comments are really just to highlight some ad additional perspectives or bring some additional uh, uh, issues that we might want to think about as we as we. Um, as we grapple with these important issues. I think the first point I, I want to make is I really appreciate the comments Iraj made around uh, pro problematizing the just transition concept. 
and perhaps bringing a bit of a broader perspective to, to that question. I, I think uh, that it, it is important. We, we tend to only focus uh, in the discussions around just transition around uh, the communities that are going to be affected by um, uh, the decline in the coal generation sector. And that is of course, usually important. Uh, to, to take the needs and considerations into account, but there are also other considerations uh, as, as, as Iraj points out. The first is just simply what's happened throughout the economy with the failure of the power sector uh, on not providing uh, adequate power and that we need to find better strategies to secure power supplies. So the considerations of, of jobs lost, investment you know, throughout the economy is an important one. Of course, the local air quality environmental impacts are an equally important one for a just transition. And then I think uh, the, uh, as important are the many communities spread throughout the country who have never participated in, in industrial activity because of the nature of our historic energy sector. There was no justness for them in the way we ran the sector historically, where there is no opportunity to spread participation in, in a more decentralized power sector more broadly across the country. I think points which we're all, all in agreement with. So there are a number of trade-offs that will have to be made. And I think that's really the key point and that should be, a, we should consider all of those. But ultimately, I think the one point that we'll all agree with is that particularly in a country such as South Africa, uh, the developmental imperative of the energy transition is going to be critical. So, uh, you know, I think in some ways, the just transition is in, in, this, in this respect very different to how one would think about it in say a European context, where essentially you don't really have a poverty and a massive unemployment problem like we've got, right? So if you, are, if you are facing an energy transition, the only really affected parties are the ones that are currently employed uh, and engaged in the legacy power system. Uh, you, you don't have a trade-off with others that are simply excluded and might benefit from the transition. So it's a much more narrow perspective where in our case, in a, a developing country environment, the, 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 the scope and the perspective necessarily has to be wider and in effect a bit more complex. So unfortunately, no simple answers there, but we at least know what the task is and that is around ensuring that there are this broad participation in this energy tran transition and that is least harm and most benefits to all those um, in all those involved. Then moving on, um, perhaps a, a comment about a, a, a perspective that might, if, if, if one thinks about the macroeconomic uh, concerns around the transition, um, that a, a perspective that might be included a bit more explicitly in, in a paper like this that we're talking about today is the issue of climate risk. So, so we know now that particularly in the next decade, as the rest of the world grapples with what is now widely accepted to be a climate crisis, and the rest of the world will be implementing, in many cases, our main trading partners, uh, dramatic measures to reduce um, emissions. Um, and to attempt to contain climate change as close as possible to one and a half degrees as agreed to by the, in, by the Paris Agreement. I think we need to, as, as South Africans, think very carefully about how that uh, 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 process in the global economy into which we are closely tied is going to affect us here. So of course, it's, all, uh, it's already affecting the finance sector. We're all aware of di the divestment movements, um, and how it affects investment in coal mines, the financing of coal mines, the financing of new coal-fired power stations, et cetera. And in general, any carbon intensive uh, act activity in the economy, that is, all, is already affecting us. Then to, be, to just look at that a bit more closer, our actual exports are increasingly going to come under pressure over the next decade as because of the extreme carbon intensity of our energy sector. So everything, as, as Iraj points out in the paper, our entire economy is built on top of the electricity sector. It's highly carbon intensive. And increasingly, we are going to be facing border tax ad adjustments when countries that we export to are implementing you know, aggressive uh, mitigation policies. And they would expect, uh, essentially, their trading partners to be doing the same. And if they don't, they will tax them accordingly. So all our com commodities, mining and other commodities exported to these jurisdictions will face increasing pressure and taxes. All our manufactured goods, given the, and keeping in mind that we are an energy intensive um, manufacturing country, will face that problem. 
Um, and then also agriculture, unfortunately, is still uh, quite energy intensive because of uh, our fossil fuel use and our carbon intensive el electricity. Again, important sector, particularly here in the Western Cape, where I'm from. And again, if we face risks and our key uh, uh, to, uh, in our exports to our key um, trading partners. And the third area here is, is the inward investment program that we're all so keen to see and that our president is working so hard to grow in, in, our, in our country at the moment. Um, Increasing many of these large multinationals are adopting uh, global climate policies and climate targets. And when they want to come to South Africa to invest, you know, whether it's an Amazon or whether it's a beverage uh, company or a motor vehicle manufacturing company or whatever it is, when they come and expand their investments in our economy, they need to, to essentially be green. They need to access clean energy. And currently with our regulatory regime, that's very difficult. So broadly speaking, all of these factors pose a significant climate risk for our economy and, and is a very important imperative uh, that we should keep in mind for this transition and how we should be driving this tr transition. I want to just move on to the uh, interesting questions it, um, it raises around um, the potential for, lo for, for localization um, and, and versus the, the potential problem of increasing our, our imports. I think this is an important question and a huge opportunity for us. So the first point I want to make is that we, as we all know, we are going to have to rapidly upscale investment in the generation part of the power sector and the grid actually in the next, over the next decade, starting immediately, right? That we know. We have to do that because we have growing demand, even though it's quite slow. We are going to have to replace capacity from closing old coal fire stations. And increasingly now, it's also economic to displace the marginal cost of burning some of the older uh, coal in some of the older plants. In other words, in some cases now already, and we see that from international studies as well, it's actually cheaper to build new renewables and displace ex uh, generation from existing coal plants. So all of these factors are going to drive us to need to invest massively in the energy sector. The second point I want to make here is, is that it's important to, to keep in mind that it's not just renewables that has the potential for importing, you know, for increasing our imports. As a matter of fact, all other technologies will ultimately have greater import components than what renewable energy is likely to have. So actually renewable energy has the potential to be the least import intensive of all the technology options that we have. And this is an important point. As a matter of fact, we know from some studies that have been done over time that with proper coordinated policy frameworks, the kind of policies that uh, Iraj talks about in their paper, uh, it's possible to localize almost all of the value chains of both solar PV uh, manufacturing and wind, also wind. And this is a huge opportunity for South Africa if we can get this right. I mean, in solar PV, fortunately, the cost of the wafers have become so cheap that that's probably the one um, element that's not really economic to import. But actually, it, from a value chain perspective, it's such a small part now of the value chain that it's not really an issue. Everything else we can manufacture and probably quite competitively. Uh, and, and, as, and as I said, the same is true for, for, for wind. So how do we achieve that? And I think there also the paper alludes to some of the policies that are necessary. If you look at the recent history, how policy uncertainty and policy um, changes have undermined the uh, early stages of the development of a local manufacturing industry and actually dec decimated the sector. We had wind turbine, wind tower manufacturers. We had uh, solar panel manufacturers. We had uh, inverter manufacturing factories. I mean, those things, those factories are also, have all shut down, have been sold, have sold off their components. It's an absolute tragedy. So we need to learn the hard lessons from that and, um, and ensure that we have policy stability uh, going forward so that, so that we give and win back the investor confidence that we need to, to get those investments again. So this interesting question about can industrial production precede li the liberalization of the policy framework that, that, that Iraj talks about. I mean, I don't think it's possible to get the IDC and other investors to start building local manufacturing facilities without there being a, a high level of certainty around demand being there for their product. So it's going to have to be a bit of a chicken and egg bootstrapping process. As we start ramping up the demand for uh, renewable um, 
products so the investors will come and start building the facilities and then we'll obviously need many policies that will support that process i'm aware of time so i'm going to move on quite quickly um there's a uh, we, we, we're also very supportive of the whole idea of growing the distributed generation industry in this country. We've just released a policy paper yesterday on our website, uh, looking at all the, the, the very quick regulatory wins that could be implemented, regulatory reforms that can immediately overnight open up the area of distributed you know, gen generation and, and help us address uh, uh, load shedding on the short term um, in a much more effective way than these large cent centralized procurement pro pro programs. So we think it's an important opportunity. However, it's important also to realize how the economics work, right? So um, large scale utility scale PV and solar projects are literally much more expensive than uh, the smaller scale rooftop type uh, projects that you'll see in commercial investments or even large large residences right so you can literally have a factor of four difference in cost and that's purely at the, at the gener generation level there are of course other benefits to, to distributed generation in the grid but to some extent we are going to have to keep in that trade-off in in mind right there is a there is a trade-off there and so we are probably going to have to have a balance between utility scale projects, which are going to be much cheaper uh, and, and a certain level of distributed generation. Um, then just a quick last or two, one or two points about the uh, impact on the fiscus of this program. Um, I, the, again, the paper makes some important points here. I think the further point one could make is the issue of government guarantees uh, for the PPAs, the power procurement agreements that stand behind the IPP investments that ESCOM ultimately is the buyer of, okay, the, the central buyer. At the moment, as we all know, the government has to underwrite that power procurement agreements because of the pure, uh, the bad um, uh, credit quality of, of ESCOM's balance sheet. So that really, uh, and, 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 and the capacity of the sovereign, of the fiscus to absorb those guarantees is now severely limited, as we all know. So really what this points to is that we need new models to, to do this. Um, essentially, we have a, a significant uh, blue chip balance sheet capacity in the private sector that is not currently utilized. And many of these companies, industries, mining, mines, etc., are actually very keen to buy renewable power. So we need new market models and regulatory reforms to allow us to leverage those balance sheets so that they can take equity positions in these projects and avoid the need for government to stand in between and guarantee these projects. So those kind of models need to be ex explored. Um, I think given the time limits, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so we've got one last speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Kramer. Um, but before we, we get to him, um, Dr. Stein, I'd just like to uh, put something uh, for you to just uh, comment on perhaps. Um, and, and that is, you know, you spoke about uh, distributed generation, um, and, and I think that is fantastic. However, it's it's become very clear um, in, in conversations, you know, with the department uh, and and ESCOM uh, that ESCOM, even though being unbundled, uh, they're still going to hold on uh, hold on to the grid. Um, you know, they they really are going to control the grid going forward. How do you see this? Um, you know, working in, in terms of we're trying to encourage uh, distributed generation, and yet we, we've got um, the one company that's still going to hold a monopoly uh, on, on, on distribution. So I'd just like to hear your, your thoughts on that. Okay, um, Dr. Krimer, uh, Kenneth Krimer is an economist. Uh, he's based at WITS. Um, he's, a, he's got a master's degree in law uh, from WITS. And in financial economics uh, from SOAS, University of London, and he's also got a PhD from WITS. Uh, currently, he's a senior lecturer at WITS, uh, but he's also a member of South Africa's uh, Presidential Economic Advisory Council, um, and he's also in the management committee of uh, SA SSFE, uh, which raises funds for tertiary education students uh, that are in need of, of support. Um, he also serves uh, in the management of Crema Media, uh, who is the publisher of Engineering News, Mining Weekly, and, and Polity. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Crema, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Luizzi. 
Um, and uh, uh, thanks for the paper and presentation by Iraj uh, and, and Tabi Singh, I think was the co-author. Um, like the other respondents, I'm in general agreement and I found the paper to be a useful contribution. Um, and luckily I'm speaking last, so I'll try not to repeat many of the points that I've already heard uh, from, from the other respondents. I think the paper is really good. Some of the thoughts I had um, reading it was, um, it really has a good grasp of the meaning of the uh, energy transition um, as a global uh, change and a technological change and change in relative costs in the uh, production of electricity and energy more broadly. Um, and that really sets the stage for, for major geopolitical changes globally, as well as economic changes. Um, when we look at uh, being a macroeconomist, um, and same as uh, Dr. Abadian as well, we, I think the reason to be very interested in, in electricity at the moment is it has such serious uh, macroeconomic implications for South Africa's growth. Um, the, the shortage of electricity and uh, the rising cost of electricity um, is quite the, ob uh, the opposite of what we experienced during the high growth phases of the 1960s, 1950s and 60s, when there was a minerals energy complex, which was the driving engine of South Africa's economy. And we're now in a situation where there's shortages of that and, and prices are increasing. The, uh, the government's uh, economic recovery plan, um, I would argue, puts um, the energy uh, problem at its very, very heart and says, well, in order to bring uh, growth and jobs back to South Africa, it is imperative that we restore uh, competitive um, uh, electricity, restore rel uh, reliable electricity as rapidly as possible, because without electricity, um, we cannot have an economic recovery. I mean, we have many challenges in this country, but it's, a, it's an essential precondition that this be resolved. Um, you know, in this debate a few years back, speaking to, to colleagues that often say it's about saving ESCOM, you know, that's how we save South Africa's electricity problem. But I think uh, uh, as is reflected in this paper, we've kind of moved up, moved on from that a bit saying, well, we have to ensure that we manage this energy transition correctly and, and through managing this energy transition correctly, ESCOM has a role to play. And as Prof Luazi, you've just said, uh, what is that role exactly? It needs to be restructured. I imagine in the longer run, we're gonna see ESCOM with a much reduced generation role in the years ahead, but a very critical um, uh, transmission function. Um, if we're going to have a national grid, which is managed in the interests of various economic outcomes, um, uh, including growth, industrialization, and managing, uh, as, uh, as one of the speakers said, I think Chris said, electricity is electricity. Uh, the paper is a bit off when it talks about different types of electricity. It needs to be managed for the in, in a national grid and that uh, transmission um, aspect of ESCOM and that uh, system management aspect is crucial um, for effective national planning. Um, then uh, this really interesting debate we've been having today on the just transition, I must say, I found uh, it quite an interesting question to think about. It's essentially a political economy question of how do we balance the various interests involved in this, uh, in this energy transition? How do we balance the interests? And um, I think uh, we, we um, can't allow the process to be held captive by vested interests uh, is one of the first things that we need to, to, to put down is that as we plan our energy transition because of the change of technology, the change of climate imperatives, the change of relative costs, we have to allow that economic rationale uh, to, to be the driving force rather than vested interest in nuclear power or in coal or in any platform, to be honest. It has to be done in an economically rational way. And what makes me anxious, I suppose, is that you need to have a very strong, capable, ethical, developmental state at the center of that planning process. Um, and it, it has to be able to plan through instruments like the IRP um, and take them uh, into a, a more rational and scientific basis of planning so that you take it out of the hands of, of vested interests. But that being said, it becomes not just a technical transition, but it's a just transition. And I think there's merit in that phrase, in that uh, phraseology because it now allows you to look at who are the winners and losers then, and then to mitigate um, and to uh, try to ameliorate problems for coal areas and coal miners and truckers, and possibly to place your, your renewable um, programs and your industrialization programs, which we've spoken about 
in a manner that um, uh, that doesn't decimate those communities. So I, I have a lot of um, uh, I think there's a lot of merits in in saying well this just transition is tantamount to talking about inclusive growth around this the most important pillar of the South Africa's economic recovery. We can't just leave it as a purely technical thing. So on the one hand, it can't be captured uh, by our vested interest. On the other hand, it can't be purely technical. It has to look at where the people, the people fit in and how the people are, are served through that process. It's the biggest game in town and needs to be managed accordingly. Um, I think just a couple more points really. The, um, the, the, regional, um, uh, the regional issue um, that the paper concludes with, uh, again, I think maybe the assumptions used were a bit too strong. I see one of the discussants in the chat have said, what about the broader, um, there's the IRP, which deals with the electricity generation, and then there's the IEP, which is the energy, uh, the energy side more broadly, including petrol and oil and everything, you know, the whole energy uh, mix of South Africa. And the paper seems to assume that we'll get uh, oil from Angola and other places and we'll put that into our cars and, uh, and we'll refine it. And, and the truth be told, the, the energy transition is so wide in, in the world at the moment that you could be led, left with stranded refining assets if uh, everything gets electrified. I mean, and there's no, there's no doubt that we're at the beginning of an epochal change. And there's talk about electrification of vehicles and more and more things. So I think uh, that in that sense, the paper's assumptions might be strong and might, might in fact be misunderstanding the, the breadth of, of and, and the depth of, of this transition that we're going through uh, globally at the moment, not just in South Africa. That being said, I mean, we need to try and use those gas assets that we're finding and gas can be part of the energy mix. There's no doubt about it. Um, and there could be export markets for gas and coal for, for many a long year to come. But I just think we must be careful about uh, assuming that we know what the energy mix will be uh, in, in the next 10 to 20 years uh, when it's th there is such a strong transition um, underway. Um, and then, yeah, my last point was just the South Africa is in an economic crisis and um, we, we need short term interventions um, as well as these longer term planning interventions. You know, um, if you looked at the data from the CSIR, we've already had more load shedding this year than last year. And last year was the worst year for load shedding on record. And this year we had COVID for most of the year. So we are extremely vulnerable to a couple of mishaps um, in our energy, uh, in our electricity generation side. And we need real urgency in this matter. And I think this is one of the things that uh, is really, uh, again, um, a stress for many of us that these processes seem to take so long. They need to be accelerated. They need to be, uh, there needs to be no complacency in that regard. And it needs to be a combination of implementing recalibrating the RP, implementing the RP in an ongoing way, creating that certainty that we can plan around and that we can try and industrialize around and create jobs around. But also in the short run, there, there needs to be deregulation so that um, more uh, independent power producers can come on stream because um, I think those two pillars working together, those two pistons of longer term planning utility scale and allowing firms that need uh, energy security to invest um, and, and allowing municipalities who are in a position to do so will help us to ease this major risk. You know, we can't afford to have our electricity turned off for hours and days on end for the next two to three years. So uh, thank you very much, Prof. That would be the end of my input. Thank you so much, Kenneth. Um, all right. We, we've come to the end of our conversation. Um, so what I think we'll do now is um, we'll just take it. Well, there's a few questions um, that need uh, our panelists to, to address. But um, I would like to start with you, Iraj. Um, I, I did uh, make a note of, of uh, what I need you to, to comment on, and now I've lost my notes. <laughs> um, what did I ask you to comment on? Okay. All right. Um, it's fine. I, uh, I think we'll 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 move on from that one. If uh, do you have any final comments uh, that, that that you'd like to make? No, I just uh, first of all, I want to thank all the uh, very very uh, helpful and, and constructive uh, observations and criticisms. Just to make two points that, uh, uh, for me, uh, perhaps talk to what Chris and 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 uh, uh, Prof. Krimer mentioned is uh, I 
I'm, I'm fully in agreement that the energy sector is going through fantastic disruption. But at the same time, I don't believe that uh, with all these disruptions, we need a transmission that takes uh, uh, energy from uh, Limpopo to, to Northern Cape or vice versa. I, I understand to the best of my research that it's a localization, local production, regional distribution, optimally configured, which is really in the back of our, our thinking in this paper. If we fail to show that, well, that, that's how I see. I don't see, when I talk about segmentation of the market, that's what I have in mind, that different types of configuration for different types of economic activity and, and social use. Um, some will be able to happily generate during the day and using during the day, others will need to store, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's one clarification. With respect to the point, very important point that, that Dr. Karim mentioned, when I look about regionalization, um, I'm seeing South Africa and Southern Africa, uh, Mozambique, Angola, South Africa as a hub of uh, industrialization or reindustrialization to use the oil and the gas that, that these neighbors have natural gas, not necessarily as power, although some of it will be, but more for petrochemical uh, industrialization. Because Sassol has got the technology, it goes to Texas and does it, but it doesn't go to next door and, and generate a hub of, uh, of energy focused, energy centric uh, petrochemicals. And I can see a lot of benefit in, in regional integration, power security, industry job creation, etc., etc. So those are the two very short observations that, that I have. Otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think that there's a few questions um, and, and I don't think any of these, I think any one of the panelists can, uh, can jump in here. Um, there's a question from Richard. Um, he asks, do you think there's any short-term prospect of, of government implementing uh, integrated energy planning for the whole energy system? Um, and, and as required by, by the Energy Act of 2008, uh, entirely earlier as the basis for the RP for electricity. So the idea here is that uh, not to be prescriptive of, of specific projects, but to fully assess opportunities and constraints. Um, Chris, would you maybe like to take that one? Yeah, it, it's an interesting one. You know, the law has required the Minister of Energy to publish an integrated energy plan since 2008. Uh, but since 2008, uh, it has never been done. And I think it's a very important issue and a very serious mission uh, for South Africa, because how can one plan properly in an integrated way between all the different energy carriers, whether it is uh, uh, renewable energy, whether it's coal, whether it's gas, whether it's liquid fuels, um, hydro, nuclear, you name it. Um, there needs to be a degree of coordination of energy policy. Uh, I mean, today uh, we, we're seeing the emergence of uh, electric vehicles uh, globally. Uh, we're seeing an emergence of a hydrogen economy, but in South Africa, we don't have an integrated approach to, uh, to energy. Uh, we have a integrated resource plan for electricity, which is just one of the energy carriers. Uh, but in the absence of a broader, uh, a, a broader policy uh, and planning framework, um, we really are grappling in the dark and other countries, uh, I look at Australia, for example, uh, are moving ahead uh, with the hydrogen economy strongly. So, uh, so is uh, Europe uh, and, and so is the world. Uh, and, and unless we start thinking about these things in an integrated way, uh, we, we're just behind the curve and we're going to be left behind. And, and we have incredible competitive advantages, for example, in the hydrogen economy uh, with tremendously good solar and wind resources, uh, with Sassel as, as a producer of, 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 of synthetic fuels. Uh, there are huge opportunities um, in, in, in this field, but, but we're gonna be left behind uh, again if, if we don't uh, get our act together. 
So I, I agree that 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 uh, integrated energy plan is important and it's a very serious omission in our planning and policy initiatives. Thank you, Chris. Um, all right, we we've got uh, Iraj needs to leave us soon. Uh, I'm trying to quickly go through the questions. I, I don't see any other questions that's directed um, to him. Um, so I think I think we can release you, Raj. Uh, thank you so much. Thank uh, you very much. Time. Thank you. Um, uh, I know we are running a few minutes behind schedule. Um, we do have a couple more questions. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye bye. All right. Um, we do have a couple more questions, um, and one of those, I think, the one is probably easy to answer. Um, and, and the question is, how do we fit into the grid? You know, is the policy allowing uh, municipalities to, to fit into the grid? Um, so my response to that would be, as of, um, I think it was middle of last month, um, the Department of Energy uh, actually released, um, uh, well, gazetted uh, amendments to electricity regulations um, to allow for new generation capacity. Um, and so municipalities uh, will be able to generate their own power. Uh, that is from Mashile. So I, I hope I do, I mean, that does answer your question, Mashile. Um, there is also um, a comment from Richard. Um, and, and the question is, the ERRP does recognize the importance of electricity in its language discussion, but does it really address the opportunities and challenges um, in its provisions and prioritization of investment opportunities? Uh, in particular, the ERP embraces uh, big gas investment in oil and gas exploration, um, but it's only you know in passing reference to to electrification. Um, Dr. Grove, you have a comment on that? Uh, I actually have a comment on the previous points about um, about feeding power into the grid for you know for for, for distributed generation. Okay. Yes, I uh, we've just we published a paper yesterday on our website that addresses exactly that that issue um, and in quite a lot of detail. And um, basically, what we point out is, is that overall, the, we are still sitting with a highly uh, regulated uh, controlled process. I mean, essentially, we have a, a, a regulatory system that controls market access, right? So it's not about, mm -hmm. we're not talking about the technical regulation and the environmental regulation that needs to happen for power projects. It's simply the question of whether an investor is allowed to enter the market or not. And that process is unfortunately, essentially politically determined by the minister. And up until now, the regulations that he or she promulgates have made it very difficult to, for new entrants to come into the market. Um, so this is not, we're not talking about the IPP program that's procured by the state. We're talking about distributed generation projects where parties want to generate power for their own supply or for jointly supplying a group of, of investors or just simply to third party supplies. That type of process is, is very, very difficult. Um, and, uh, and even the regulations for the municipalities procuring the own power that you referred to, unfortunately, still puts all the power in the hands of the minister to make the decision or not. And no clear criteria why that would be. I mean, um, Essentially, in, in our constitutional setup, the you know th government, uh, the mun mun municipal sector, is a sovereign sphere of government, and uh, it's you know they can decide whether they need to build a water purification plant or a sewage plant. Why can't they decide whether they need to procure some power? You know, and why does a, a, a central government minister needs to decide on that? And that's um so that again uh, uh, and all of these uh, regulatory framework essentially is a legacy system that was designed to, to essentially to protect the monopoly of the incumbents in particular the ESCOM the generator so it, it, it comes from a previous era where we relied on on coal-fired mega projects as the model for getting the least cost electricity it didn't actually work out that way but that was the plan and um, 
And the thinking was, well, these mega projects are so huge and entail such financial risk that the only way to get low cost financing for those projects is to protect the incumbent from competition. So we created a monopoly on purpose to do that. Now that model for many reasons that we all know right today is now not is highly dysfunctional now does not serve our needs anymore and it's now official policy that we need to introduce competition into the into the sector from the president minister of public enterprises even the minister of energy but our regulatory system is still stuck in the past and does not actually allow that to happen so we need quite substantial regulatory reforms and in this paper we just published yesterday on our, we make it very clear that there are actually significant reforms that can be implemented almost overnight by changing the regulations that and simply lifting for instance the threshold at which you need to apply for a generation license from the current one megawatt to about at least 50 megawatts uh, we make a few other recommendations around completely deregulating uh, projects for own use um, uh, from the need to re require a generation, a market access license from those, and purely just the leaving those projects um, uh, uh, to get the L in, in, in environmental approvals and get the grid connection approval from the grid op operator, which would mostly be ESCOM or the municipality. Those kind of reforms will be the quickest and most effective way to address load shedding on the short term while the longer uh, uh, centralized procurement programs, you know, slowly work themselves through the system. It's going to take years to get those projects online. And of course, the, the effect on economic sen sentiment, investor confidence, et cetera, will be massive. These distributed generation projects are also the ones that uh, are definitely the most labor intensive uh, and the benefits of which will be spread throughout the, through, throughout the country and through, throughout the economy. Thanks, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, okay, I think we really only have uh, time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, there's a quick question here. I think, uh, Kenneth, perhaps you can comment on this one. Um, and the question is, have we assessed uh, what it would cost the SA economy um, you know, to, to pay for, for the transition to be quote unquote just uh, by 2030? Um, the example given here that uh, in the EU, uh, for each euro spent on infrastructure, two euros are spent on socioeconomic uh, impact mitigation measures. Uh, and I think Chris, you could also perhaps uh, chime in there, um, but let's try and keep it short. Yeah, let's find it. Chris or Hruvia, because I'm not really aware of those studies, so I don't want to waffle about it. Okay, great. Um, Chris, any yeah, I, I'm going to defer to, to Hruvia. I, I would be out of my depth uh, speaking on that. Um, Hruvia, can you handle that? Yes, I'm afraid we, we are actually busy with a, we have a draft paper almost ready for a publication which has, in, in, investigates the, the cost of different types of interventions. So we haven't costed the whole program, but we're trying to start to get a sense of what the different socioeconomic and semi-economic interventions would cost to uh, address some of these uh, just transition needs in, in the core areas. I'm sorry, I don't have right, good numbers for you right now, but what one can say I think with uh, you know, confidence given that our circumstances are just so different to what it would be in Europe, is of course, we just simply don't have the fiscal resources to spend as much in direct concessional um, uh, funding for socioeconomic uh, needs as, um, as they can in more wealthy societies. What that means is two things from our point of view. Firstly, is that we are going to have to be very smart about how we roll out our renewable industry and in particular the localization part of that to maximize the, the of course, the employment opportunities and the industrialization opportunities. So we are going to have to deal with the socioeconomic uh, implications by creating new economic opportunities uh, for, 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 for people and, and focus our investments around training and et cetera to, to make that, to help people with that transition. So it's, it's gonna to have to be very smart. We're gonna to have to be very smart about that. The other um, uh, point we haven't raised today is that uh, there is huge uh, appetite internationally from funders to support South Africa with this socio, with a kind of just transition socioeconomic side of things. And, and in particular, if we commit to a, a large climate finance tran transaction. So we've been doing a lot of work on that. And essentially, uh, some of you might've heard about this, The the, essentially, the concept would be that we, South Africa commits to an accelerated energy transition that will accelerate our CO2 mitigation. And in return for that, in principle, we could potentially attract significant amounts of highly concessional funding to help 
us with this just transition obligation and also with some of the other challenges at ESCOM. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. Um, one last question. Um, and, and this is for the panel as a whole, I think uh, anyone feels brave enough to tackle. Um, so the, the comment is well, with reference to Dr. Stein's correct observation that private sector financing remains insufficiently tapped. What are your thoughts about reviving a nationwide FIT? Uh, perhaps, perhaps I could come in here. Um, yeah, look, the, the feed-in tariff provides a lot of certainty, um, but it may be that it's uh, not the least cost option, um, and competitive uh, bidding uh, processes uh, might be more efficient in terms of keeping the cost uh, at, at its most efficient lowest cost for the customer. Um, the feed-in tariffs can be such that they create uh, excessive supply uh, because they pitched wrongly and then uh, need to change. Uh, and, and this creates uncertainty. So I'm personally not sure that a feed-in tariff is necessarily the right approach. Um, and I would look to more market-driven pricing. Uh, um, while I've, I've got the uh, mic, um, I, uh, perhaps I could also uh, reply to a question that um, Professor Lawazi posed to me right at the beginning, to say, how do direct and indirect subsidies of coal in the coal industry prolong decarbonization? Of course, they do prolong it. Um, I mean, normally subsidies are put in place to promote change to new uh, technologies. So, uh, for example, in the renewable energy space, initially there were, were subsidies in the sense of the price of renewable energy for around one, two, and three was uh, quite high, uh, higher than the alternatives, uh, but it was uh, sort of legislated that those would be chosen technologies with a view to them coming down in future. So uh, those subsidies were put in place to drive uh, the renewable energy program forward. Uh, but at the same time, you have the subsidies uh, uh, for coal, both direct and indirect, which are really prolonging the coal situation. Uh, and, and for me, that's it's just uh, illogical, uh, but there. And to some extent, we see the regulator, I think, playing a, uh, a very confused role in South Africa uh, because in the legislation, in the Electricity Regulation Act, the regulator has given the task of, of basically uh, controlling the pace of change uh, to make sure it's done in an orderly fashion. So they see their role as to try and provide a central controlling uh, process of orderly change uh, in their own minds. Uh, what is orderly and disorderly, uh, you know, could be argued. <laughs> and, and they also see this transition uh, to self-generation, for example, as anti-poor. And they see that the, their role is also to protect the poor. So they, they're taking on a lot of political um, uh, responsibilities and roles which I don't believe they, they, they should have at all uh, but they see you know that rich people will be able to put in their own self-generation leaving the poor people on the grid uh, which has less sales from Eskom who therefore in terms of the regulatory processes can put up the price and so that the poor will pay more because they didn't can't afford to go off the grid and that nurses sees their role to protect the poor. Uh, so in, in the way, you know, these subsidies uh, uh, are used as ways of, of achieving political uh, goals and, uh, and, and controlling the pace of change, which I don't think is really or should be the role of the regulator. But no doubt in my mind that uh, subsidies are slowing down the transition in the coal subsidies. But on the other hand, the financial sector is speeding up the process by refusing to finance new coal uh, in South Africa and globally. 
and and this is accelerating uh, change. So you just have these competing forces that, that are just not consistent, uh, and and that's part of the problem as I see it. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, well, this discussion could go on forever, really. Um, but um, yeah, I'd really like to thank my panelists. Uh, thank you so so much for taking the time, um, and 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 everyone who joined us in on this webinar. Um, thank you. So so, so much. Uh, Dr. Nguenya, do you perhaps have a closing word? Um, no, thank you, uh, Prof. Loazi. I think there's been, uh, there's so much more, as you said, um, that can be said about this topic. And just to say, we have commissioned a paper looking uh, a bit more into the regional energy dynamics, um, some of the discussions about coal, gas, um, petroleum. So there'll certainly be a platform for us to have a more in-depth discussion. I think we need to allocate more time. It's quite clear. Yeah, um, certainly. <laughs> certainly. So thank you very much to everybody and, and um, Merry Christmas, everybody. We'll see everyone in the new year. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Dr. Stein, Dr. Krimer. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. All right, bye. Bye.